1922 publication of James Joyce's Ulysses by the fearless and indomitably spirited Paris bookseller Sylvia Beach was an epochal event in literary history. Fearless and indomitable and even heroic fits in many ways for Beach. One of them is that she risked disgrace, the loss of her business, and arrest for publishing Joyce's masterpiece. Miraculously, it all worked out. Though after publication, copies of the book would be confiscated, including by the United States Customs, where it remained a banned book until December 6, 1933, when Judge John Woolsey ruled that however brilliant or boring, honest or disgusting Ulysses was, it was not obscene. But Joyce's work had from the beginning been subject to unceasing censorship from all quarters. Don't tell the truth about people. Don't tell how they actually speak or what they think about or what they actually do in the course of the day. It was that simple. Printers, publishers, and public arbiters of taste wanted a tidied up, idealized and sanitized version of human beings. Joyce is really the ultimate realist about our lives and wouldn't budge. And this was just too much. If a drunk character in a bar is going to use the word bloody in a description, Joyce would too, and you better bloody well believe it. Joyce's refusal to bend on the word bloody helped tie up the publication of Dubliners for years. Four years previous to the publication of Ulysses in book form, the similarly heroic Margaret Anderson and Jean Heap published most of the book in serial form in the pages of their magazine, The Little Review. They served jail time and confiscated issues for their efforts, and the cluster of troubles helped destroy one of the great literary magazines of all time. And so here it is, in March 1918, the first appearance of the first chapter of Ulysses. Stately, plump Buck Mulligan came down from the stairhead, bearing a bowl of lather, on which a mirror and a razor lay crossed. A yellow dressing gown, ungirded, was sustained gently behind him in the mid-mild morning air. He held the bowl aloft. For this, Oh, dearly beloved, is the genuine Christine, body and soul and blood and oons. Slow music, please. Shut your eyes, gents. One moment. Oh, a little trouble with those white corpuscles. Silence all. Since I'm releasing this video at midnight Dublin time as June 15th becomes June 16th or Bloomsday, celebrating Leopold and Molly Bloom and James Joyce who brought them and Stephen Dedalus so gloriously alive for the single day of June 16th, 1904. Here is Bloom's first appearance in the fourth issue of the Little Review. And happy Bloom's Day now and always. Mr. Leopold Bloom ate with relish the inner gorgons of beasts and fowls. He liked thick giblet soup, nutty gizzards, a stuffed roast heart, liver slices fried with crust crumbs, fried cods, rows. Most of all, he liked grilled mutton kidneys, which gave to his palate a fine pang of faintly scented urine. Kidneys were in his mind as he moved about the kitchen softly, writing her breakfast things on the humpy tray. Gelid light and air were in the kitchen, but out of doors, gentle summer morning everywhere made him feel a bit peckish. Throughout Ulysses, Joyce treats us to an extraordinarily complex representation of the thoughts of Stephen Dedalus, Leopold Bloom, and Molly Bloom, all of whom have internal dialogues that tend to move toward wordplay, heightened language, and some form of poetry. Stephen Dedalus's mother has recently died, and again and again memories of her beset 
Stephen's brooding brain any time there is an external trigger of any sort. She and his grief and trauma over her are present, but it's more than that. Every time he remembers her, we watch Stephen in the very process of turning loss into heightened poetic language and him experiencing the catharsis of creating poetry and the transfiguring experience of transforming grief into art. It isn't fully poetry yet, but we watch the very process of poetry in its birthing. In this passage, I love from Telemachus, the first chapter of Ulysses, snatches of poetry from William Butler Yeats sail into Stephen's mind and the world takes on a verbal numinosity as we experience his process of world becoming poem. Turn no more aside and brood upon love's bitter mystery, for Fergus rules the brazen cars. Wood shadows floated silently by through the morning peace from the stairhead windward, where he gazed inshore and further out the mirror of water whitened, spurred by light-shod hurrying feet, white breast of the dim sea, the twinning stresses two by two, a hand plucking the harp strings, merging their twining chords, wave-white wetted words shimmering in the dim tide. A cloud began to cover the sun, slowly shadowing the bay in deeper green. It lay behind him, a bowl of bitter waters, Fergus's song. I sang it alone in the house, holding down the long dark chords. Her door was open. She wanted to hear my music, Silent with awe and pity, I went to her bedside. She was crying in her wretched bed for those words, Stephen, love's bitter mystery. Where now? Her secrets, old feather fans, tasseled dance cards, powdered with musk, a gaud of amber beads in her locked drawer, a birdcage hung in the sunny window of her house. When she was a girl, she hold old Royce, sing in the pantomime of Turco the Terrible, and laughed with others when he sang, I am the boy that can enjoy invisibility. Phantasmal mirth folded away, musk perfumed, and no more turn aside and brood. Folded away in the memory of nature with her toys, memories beset his brooding brain, her glass of water from the kitchen up when she had approached the sacrament, a cored apple filled with brown sugar roasting for her at the hob on the dark autumn evening, her shapely fingernails reddened by the blood of squashed lice from the children's shirts. In a dream, Silently she had come to him, her wasted body within its loose grave clothes, giving off an odor of wax and rosewood. Joyce was writing the Telemachus chapter in the late teens, and throughout that chapter and the rest of the book, the memory of his mother's death keeps coming up. At some times, it's so personal and expressionistic, you almost feel like you're in the territory of later poets. I'll read another time it comes up just slightly edited with no words added, a few things taken out, but think of it in the mode not of Joyce, but of the confessional poets, sort of someone following Celia Plath or Anne Sexton, Robert Lowell, the jagged granite fraying the edge of a coat sleeve, pain, not yet the pain of love fretted him. Silently in a dream she had come to him, her wasted body within its loose brown grave clothes, smelling of wax and rosewood, her breath of wet ashes upon him, silent, mute, reproachful, beside her a bowl of white china holding the green sluggish bile death's vomit, 
No, mother, let me be and let me live. That reading might not be completely fair to Joyce, but it points out that the poetry of Ulysses comes in many forms, and if the confessional poets many decades later sometimes sound like Joyce, it's because Ulysses was carving out poetic worlds we would all take time to move into. Molly Bloom's soliloquy at the end of Ulysses as she is drifting off to sleep is surely one of the most lyrically and poetically intense passages in all fiction. I got him to propose to me, yes. First I gave him the bit of seed cake out of my mouth, and after that long kiss I near lost my breath, yes. And he said, I was a flower of the mountain, yes, and we all are flowers of the mountain, and oh, that awful deep down torrent, and oh, the sea, the sea crimsons sometimes like fire, and the glorious sunsets and the fig trees and the Alameda Gardens, yes, and all the queer little streets and the pink and blue and yellow houses and the rose gardens and the jasmine and geraniums and cactuses and Gibraltar as a girl when I was a flower of the mountains, yes. And then I asked him with my eyes to ask again, yes. And then he asked me, would I say yes? My mountain flower, and first I put my arms around him, yes, and drew him down to me so he could feel my breasts, all perfume, yes, and his heart was going like mad, and yes, I said, yes, I will, yes. The photo in the background is Nora Barnacle from Galway, who Joyce met in 1904 and asked out on a date. The first date, she stood him up. The second date, she showed up. And that date was June 16th, 1904. Without Nora, there would still have been books for Joyce to write, but they would have been less than, for Nora was always there as friend, lover, and muse, and finally as wife. Without Nora, there would have been no Molly Bloom and no June 16th to write about and no Ulysses to commemorate every year on Bloom's Day. This is Anna Livia Pluribel speaking from the final pages of James Joyce's 1939 masterpiece, Finnegan's Wake. Anna the Amazeful, the ever-living, the bringer of pluribilities, is speaking as she's drifting dreamward, but also as mythic Anna and anima and animus, she is drifting into the river Liffey as it flows out to sea, then evaporates only to rain down again, filling the rivers in an endless cycle of recirculation. And as Anna passes into dream and into river, she remembers snatches of her childhood and adolescence and adulthood. And Joyce is using a highly poetic and pleasantous and punning language to suggest night and sleep and dream. So just drift into Joyce's wonders and happy Bloomsday. There'll be others, but none for me, night after night, so that I long to go and still withal. One time you'd stand forensed me, fairly laughing in your bark and tan billows of branches for to fan me coolly, and I'd lie quiet as a moss. And one time you'd rush upon me, darkly roaring like a great black shadow with a sheeny stare to pierce me rawly, and I'd frozen up and pray for thaw. Three times in all, I was the pet of everyone then, a principal girl, the in-vision of Indland. And by Thoreau, you looked it, my lips went livid from the joy of fear, like almost now. How? How you said you'd give me the keys of me heart, and we'd be married till death to us part. Alas, I wished I had better glances to peer to you through this bay lights growing. But you're changing, a cool shot, 
you're changing from me, I can feel, or is me is, I'm getting mixed, brightening up and tightening down, you're changing, son, husband, and you're turning, I can feel you for a daughter wife from the hills again, im la maya, and she's coming, coming, swimming in my hind moist, Dival taking on me tail, just a whisk, brisk, sly, spry, spink, spank, sprint of the thing. There's some there, salt relling. I pity your old self I was used to. Now a younger's there. Try not to part. Be happy, dear ones. May I be wrong, for she'll be sweet for you as I was sweet. When I came down out of me, mother, my great blue bedroom, the air so quiet, scarce a cloud, in peace and silence, I could have stayed up there for always, only. It's something fails us. First we feel, then we fall. And let her reign now as she likes gently, or strongly as she likes. Anyways, let her reign for my time is come. I done me best when I was let, thinking always, if I go, all goes. A hundred cares, a tithe of troubles, and is there one who understands me, one in a thousand years of the nights? All me life I have been lived among them, but now they're becoming loath to me, and I am loathing their little warm tricks and loathing their mean cozy turns and all the greedy gushes out through their small souls and all the lazy leaks down over their brash bodies. How small it is all, and me letting on to myself always and lilting on all the time, I thought you were all glittering with the noblest of carriage. You're only a bumpkin. I thought you the great in all things, in guilt and in glory. You're only a puny home. My people were not their sort out beyond there so far as I can. For all the bold and the bad and the bleary, they're blamed. The sea hags no, nor for all our wild dances, in all their wild din, I can see myself among them, Alan Nuvia Polkrebeld. How she was handsome, the wild Amazia, when she would seize to mine other breast, and what is she weird, the haughty Naluna, that she will snatch from mine ownest hair? For tis they are the stormies. Ho, oh, hang, hang ho, and the clash of our cries, till we spring to be free, or a volus, they say, never heed of your name, but I'm loathing them that's here, and all that I loathe, lonely in my loneness. For all their faults, I am passing out. Oh, bitter ending, I'll slip away before they'll up. They'll never see, nor know, nor miss me. And it's old, and it's old, and it's sad, and it's old, and it's sad, and it's weary, and I go back to you, my cold father, my cold, mad father, my cold, mad, fiery father, till the near sight of the mere size of him, the moils and moils of it, moan a moaning, makes me see silt, salt, sick, and I rush my only into your arms. I see them rising. Save me from those terrible prongs. Two more, one, two, more men's more. So, avil lavil, my leaves have drifted from me all. But one clings still. I'll bear it on me to remind me of. Leaf, so soft this morning hours. Yes, carry me along, Taddy, like you done through the toy fair. If I'd seen him bearing down on me now under white spread wings like he'd come from archangels, I think I'd die down over his feet, humbly, dumbly, only to wash up. Yes, Tid, there's where, 
First, we pass through the grass, behush the bush to whish, a gull, gulls, far calls, coming far, end here, us then, fin again, take, but softly, me memor me, till thou sends thee, lips, the keys to, given, away, alone, alas, a loved, along the river run, past Eve and Adam, and bend of bay, and swerve of shore, brings us by a commodious vicus of recirculation back. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to my channel. It would mean a lot to me. I have other James Joyce videos coming soon. Also a video about the poets, Gerard Manley Hopkins, Jeffrey Hill, and Hilda Doolittle, as well as an exploration of the ways the 1933 pulp hero Doc Savage responded brilliantly to the anxieties and pains of the Great Depression. Thank you for watching.